Go ahead, hit the gas, we'll get to going. And, um, you know, we've been talking about this for a lot of weeks now. And uh, this will probably be the last in this phase of this. Because as I said earlier, I believe God wants us to step up our game. I mean, it, there's... I don't know all what you research and what you all look into, but the more that I keep looking into things and researching things, let me just throw out an example to you. The school system in, it's either Indiana or Iowa, not Iowa, Illinois, I think it's Illinois, is now having Satan clubs after school. Elementary school, setting up satanic clubs inviting all the kids in the school system to come and join this after-school thing. Do you know it's like trying to pull teeth to get a Bible club started in a school? So again, this is no joke. Like I said, I give real examples, real-life examples, because we live in a real world. So there's real things going on that, unfortunately, well, let me, let me just start here. You know, we've been looking at this for some weeks, and what we're trying to do is properly identify the wiles of the devil so that we won't be ignorant of his attacks anymore, and not only that, but how to counter his attacks so that we can may walk in complete victory every day of our lives. Complete victory, that word is not there by accident. We don't win some and lose some. This isn't a football game. No, we as believers win every time. Now, as I said earlier about the furnace kind of dying last week, I shared this Friday night, what would have happened if that happened Monday morning and no one was here? And then Tuesday came when we were sub-zero weather. And I would have come in Friday like we did early to turn the heat on and it would have been off all week long. No one would have ever known. Probably pipes would have been burst downstairs. It would have been really ugly. So thank you, Lord, for giving us a heads up. You know, you're not going to avoid issues. But he can help guide you through those issues. Even though it was a hassle and it was a real discouragement on how it went, if you keep the right attitude about it, just like now, a pipe froze. Okay, we're going to get it fixed. It'll be running before we leave, in Jesus' name. Okay, but at least we're getting a heads up. He's with us. He works with us. Now, what I want you to remember is failure is not an option. As our Lord has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, if our Lord lived his life on this earth in complete victory and never failed, we can also, if you will purposefully destroy the mindsets that are holding you back. That's what God really impressed on me. I said, God, I want everything. I want all things. And it's like he says, you've got to get rid of the stuff that's holding you back. That's the problem. We all got junk that's holding us back. Because again, in John 14, 12, this is what I was saying earlier. He says, I tell you the truth. Catch that. He says, I'm telling you the truth. That amazes me that Jesus actually had to say, I'm telling you the truth. It's kind of like a little emphasis. I'm telling you the truth. And the next word, if you're following along in your notes, says anyone. Are you in anyone? We're all in anyone. Anyone who believes in me. Now, like I said earlier, believing isn't the issue because when we speak, it creates images. So when you hear, by his stripes you are healed, you hear that, you repeat it, the problem isn't what you're believing that, the problem is what you're creating an image of that. Because as soon as you hear that, there's an image that forms in your mind that, no, you ain't, your arm's broke. No, by his stripes I'm healed. No, you ain't, your arm broke. See, what we do is take the image of the now and not allow the image of the word to be created. Because an image needs to be created first for it to come to manifestation. You know, if you've listened to anything of Andrew Walmack, he always says you have to see yourself healed before you become healed. 
You need to see that image. That's where the fight is. It's not so much in the belief where you can parrot the Word of God. It's in the belief in the heart where you can create the image out of your heart to see that thing. So I can see now that water running in Jesus' name down there and that thermostat going up. You have to create that image before it manifests. You have to speak those things. He says, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I've done. You'll do the same thing. He says, and even greater. And I always find this amazing when people bring up this verse, they always want to fight over that little phrase. What is greater? What does greater mean? Da 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 da. You ain't even doing the first part. You're not even believing that you can actually do what he does. Because if you did, you'd be doing it. Or at least, like I said in my earlier example, sowing those seeds so that it now comes to fruitation and it starts to roll and it happens more regularly. Not because you, now it's working or now it's kicked in. No, it's from all those seeds you sowed back there. You're finally starting to see the harvest of things you planted back there. Because that's how this works. And I want to remind you that your enemy knows you better than you know yourself. You've got to really get that. Thus, each attack he wages against you is personalized. The enemy knows your hurts, habits, and hang-ups because he's been watching you and messing with you your whole life. He knows what buttons he can push to ev and evoke a response. Failure to stop him dead in his tracks at these first couple of levels that I've already shared with you can be devastating and lasting ramifications in your life if you don't stop them, even to the place where you may end up walking away from God. Because once you get to this last stage, you may end up walking away from God. Unless you nip it in the bud early on. Unless when the distraction comes, you say, no, I ain't being distracted. I ain't being distracted by them stupid numbers you put on the TV. Since when have we ever started putting on the TV how many people are sick in the state? I don't give a flip how many people are sick in the state. We've never done that before. I don't care. You want me to help you? I know other people that you probably ain't got there that's been sick this week, past week. Yeah, let me send you a couple more numbers. I mean, what does that do? Well, we know what it does, but again, we've got to stop the distractions. What is really important in life? Because if you don't stop that distraction, then they want you to become fixated on it. So, next slide, if you would, my brother. The Holy Spirit, I feel, has been pleading with us that it's now time to step up our game. It's now time to step it up. Wickedness, witchcraft is at an all-time high, yet the church is still functioning like it did years ago. Now, this hit me when I read this. I was thinking about this. You know what? I'm not just preaching to you here. I'm preaching to everyone that's going to watch this. So the audience is already bigger. So some of the things I may say, it's like, that ain't us. No, you're right. I'm preaching to everybody that's watching. So I agree. We're not that church. We're not that church that's functioning like it used to. You know? The church needs to stop functioning like it's still years ago, not discerning the signs of the times. I mean, some churches just boggle my mind. They're just trudging along like it's the 1980s and... Seeker sensitive and still playing all the hill songs and all the stuff. It's like, you know, let's just come along and, and God's gushy and lovey and cushy and we're just all going to love one another and sing kumbaya. It's, man. Now, again, I'm not ranking on stuff. I'm just saying I sense such an urgency now in my spirit, and I believe the Holy Spirit wants us to understand you're not discerning the times. You have no idea where you're at. I mean, I could just say, say these things, Sweden, 5G, this thing, and some of you are going to go, bingo, light goes off. I think you're sitting there like, oh, oh, what the heck is he talking about? Because again, that's where we're at. We think we're okay in our own little cluster. We're going to come, we're going to sing some songs and listen to a message. We're going to go home and live life and everything's going to be cool. No, because that's been the problem. We've allowed wickedness to become rampant because we just want to get along. Didn't you understand Jesus said when he comes, he's going to bring division with a sword? 
even in their own families. See, we don't want to look at that stuff. That's what I mean. We're functioning on past mindsets. The church especially, you know, it, it's wickedness and witchcraft is at an all-time high. The rise of wickedness must be met with a rise of dunamis power. The Holy Spirit power must start flowing through each of his kids in a fresh and powerful way. There can be no more sitting on the sidelines. No more letting the other guy do the battling. Being an observer is no longer an option as wickedness is literally knocking at your door. Do you understand in some countries wickedness is going to start knocking at the door to do this if you are not that? They're going to now force you to do that in other countries. So again, I'm not just talking about us here in Concord. No, you need to get a world perspective. God sits high and sees it all. We have to have the same perspective that he has and discern things from his perspective. So next, if you would, next slide. Again, we're just going to kind of touch on all these points. I've already preached on them all. You've got to understand the devil is out to destroy your life. Luke twenty-two thirty-one. 31. Next slide, if you would. The tactics that, that the enemy uses, he manifests in four ways, doesn't he? Got the dragon, the serpent, the devil. We've already talked about all these. This week we're going to talk about and Satan. He also uses foreign forces that we see in, well, let me give you the verse for that last one, was Revelation 12, 9. He manifests in four manifestations. Ephesians 6, 12. There's four levels of enforcers. In Mark 5, 19, he sends a legion every time he attacks you, which ought to make you feel good. Like I keep saying, it takes a thousand of them to take on one of you. Because they, do you understand that the demons know better who you are in Christ than you do? That's why so many have to go after you. They understand if you ever got a hold of this, you're doing some butt kicking like Buffalo did last night on the Pats. They're just going to run all over you. They know you can run all over them. That's why the Bible says one will send how many to the flight? A thousand. That's why they send a thousand. One can send a thousand running. Now let me give you a personal revelation I got. I started thinking about this. Why the number four? I notice there's four manifestations and four enforcers. Why? What, what does the number four even mean? So biblically, when you look up the number four, biblically represents creation, all this physical realm. But then you can also find spiritual definitions. And I thought this was interesting when I looked it up. It says, the number four is the number of being. And it's the number connected with mind, body, spirit. Or I'd like to call the flesh and the soul. Because I don't think it so much messes with the spirit. With the physical realm of structure and organization, the symbol of... <clears throat> excuse me, symbolic meaning of the number four deals with stability and invokes grounded nature of all things. So again, it's dealing with being, physical, soulish, physical realm. The number four is an indication that your angels are offering you love, support, and encouragement. Now again, this is probably a new agey type thing, but coming from a spiritual point of view, it says, um, and I'll just skip down to here, Angel number four encourages you to put proper preparation into your plans and set things in motions with systems and orders to achieve your goals and aspirations. So when I looked at the number four, when you just take it as a whole, it deals with the flesh realm, with the physical realm. That's where the enemy attacks you from. The enemy can only attack us in this fleshly realm, so to speak. He wants to get you grounded in the flesh. He wants you to think like a flesh being. He wants you to think like a mere, mere human being, act like a mere human being, react like a mere human being, feel like a mere human being. He doesn't want to engage you. He doesn't want you engaging in your spirit, man. He wants to ground you in this realm. And when I thought about that, then the Lord gave me two verses. He gave me 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 again, which says, Satan, who is the God of this world, 
has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. He's the God of this world. He got kicked out of that realm. He's the God of this world. These four manifestations and these four enforcers want to ground you into humanity because that's where they can defeat you. I'm getting this image now. You've, we've all seen that image of an eagle with its holding a snake on the ground. Well, if it holds a snake on the ground, they're on even turf, right? But when that eagle takes that snake and flies up in the sky, guess who has the advantage? The eagle. We've got to do the same thing. We've got to be not grounded here, but when we're dealing with these things, fly. Come from the position that you came from. We came from there to here. Keep that mindset. That's why he gave me this too in, in Colossians 3 2. To stay focused on what's above, not on earthly things. So when I came to fix the furnace last Monday, it's like I can't stay focused on this. This is confusing me. I don't understand. See, he knew how to push my buttons because I get very frustrated when I don't understand things. And especially if somebody can't explain it to me. Now, we're starting to get frustrated with that tech that came, but then all of a sudden the thought came into my mind, Jim, you've been there before. You've given customers lines of stuff that your boss told you to say. I remember my boss told me once flat out to lie to him. I said, I ain't lying to him. You better come up with a better answer than that because I ain't lying to him. I ain't going to lie to make us look good. So he did. And I said, okay, I can do that. That ain't a lie. You don't want to get ground. You want to stay focused there. So I kept focusing there. All things are possible. I can do all things. I lack nothing. Is where you got to stay. Same Colossians 3, 2 in the Passion Translation says this, Yes, feast on all the treasures of the heavenly realm. Now catch this phrase, because this is the important part for what I'm sharing. Fill your thoughts with heavenly realities and do <clears throat> and not with the distractions of the natural realm. Don't get distracted with the natural realm. <coughs> Don't get distracted with what all the stuff they keep putting up on the news. That's a distraction of the natural realm. So when you see it, it's not to, again, I don't know why I got to keep explaining this. I just keep hearing it in my spirit that, oh, then I'm just to avoid it or whatever. No, I still had to deal with the thing downstairs. You come from the proper perspective. When I went to deal with fixing the furnace, I dealt with it from a heavenly perspective, not an earthly perspective. Because when I was grounded in the earthly perspective, I was all nervous, anxious, upset, upset stomach. I ended up taking Tums before I come over here on Monday. I just was all worked up. Because my flesh was reacting to my mind. Because it knows when I get confused, I get wigged out in the flesh. So I had to step in spiritually and say, no, I can do this. It will get done. I don't need anyone else but you, Lord. And look what he did. Praise God. That was all him. Because I had to reset my head. And that's the part I hope we really get this morning. There are things in our minds and in our hearts that are holding us back from being able to do all things through Christ that strengthens me. And those things need to get destroyed. So next slide, if you would. So again, the first level we've talked about is disease. What do we mean? The great dragon, his mission is to inflict disease in your life through any means possible. He's been real good at it for the last five weeks in a row, ain't he? And I'm sure in some of you all lives too. The last five weeks in a row, he ain't let up. I tell you, he hates to be exposed. See, the difference is he can't shut us up like the media can. All types of media. <coughs> he can't shut us up. But he's sure going to create some disease because he don't want to be exposed. Because what's the greatest enemy to the lie? Truth. The truth. Why? It's the truth that sets you free. 
His enforcers are what? Principalities. They enforce the inflicted disease by the dragon by any means possible. Next slide, if you would. Level two attack is this. Now again, it's not so much as sequential. I also want to remind you, you can be in, being attacked at level one over here, level two in another area of your life, level three in another area of your life. <clears throat> it's not like logically sequential, step by step. Although it can, I want to break it down that way so we can see it and nip it in the bud. Stop it right away at the distraction. Whenever a distraction is happening, what I do now and say, that's simply a distraction. Is it a real problem? Sure. Is it a real issue? Sure. But it's only a distraction. I'm not going to make the thing bigger than it really is. That help you? Because that's what this world does. Every issue this world comes up with is earth ending. Everything is earth ending. It doesn't matter what it is. It's earth ending. No, it's simply a distraction. So if you don't stop it at the distraction stage, now stage two, he wants to cause you to get fixated on and mesmerized by it. Why? So that's all you see? That's all you talk about? That's the only thing that causes you to function? You re now revolve your life around the issue. That's step two. And the forces are powers. They want to keep you fixated on that. So it's always in your face. Always in your face. It's like you can't get away from it. It's always in your face. You go out to the store. Signs on the door about these things. You know, you, you try to just put on the news to check out the weather, stuff about these things. I mean, it's on and on and on, constantly in your face. That's this stage, because it only wants you to focus on it, think about it, and talk about it. Step three, this is what we talked about last week. Next slide, if you would, strongholds. Now again, like I said last week, we've got this misconception because we've seen pictures of stronghold just being a chain and one link being broke. Or we see ropes around people's wrists that are tied and it's like cutting the ropes. That's not a stronghold. This is a stronghold. That's literally what it means. That is a stronghold. And the devil is the one that manifests at this stage because he wants to create reprogram you with a deceptive belief system through constant lies and deceptions which will eventually build a stronghold in your soul man. He wants to reprogram your mindset and your belief system in a deceptive manner that now you believe this thing to be true in your life. See, strongholds are built brick by brick. Each brick laid only strengthens the previous brick that was laid. Once completely erected, it is, highly, it is highly likely you will need assistance in order to identify and dismantle this stronghold. You can also have multiple strongholds in your lives in different areas. And the reason why I say you need help because people who have strongholds don't think they have strongholds. They can't even see it for themselves. It's obvious in other people's lives. You know how it's obvious? That's all they think about. That's all they talk about. That's all that causes them to react in life. That's a stronghold. That means you are not in control and the thing is in control. And you know it's in control because that's all you can think about and talk about. But then when you point it out to somebody, they're like, oh, no, no, that's not a problem in my life. It's like, really? That's why you need help, because many times you can't even identify it as a stronghold. And the dismantling part, you literally feel like you're ripping your soul out. You literally think you're losing yourself because you think that is you. Because that's how deceptive and deep this gets. And that's how powerful it gets. Look at when they marched around Jericho, it took a miracle to tear that thing down. Now, I'm not saying you need a miracle to tear it down, but unless you identify it and you start working at it and you're persistent at it and consistent at it, you're probably not going to pull it down by yourself when you get to this place. You're going to need some help. The enforcer, the demonic enforcers, are rulers of darkness of this age. And again, go back and watch last week's message. I'm not going to re-preach it. 
but their mission is to help establish the stronghold in your life. They do this by causing heaviness, darkness, deception to the point that you can no longer see the truth, hear the truth, discern the truth on your own. That's what I mean. You can't even identify it anymore. You know, and what you start doing is you start even trying to come up with scripture to justify your stronghold. <clears throat> no, it's just getting twisted and lied to like the devil tried to use scripture against Jesus. He does the same to you to keep you in bondage. Oh yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that's right. So this condition, if not addressed, will ultimately lead to a seared or dead conscious. Apostasy will soon be knocking at the door of your soul. That's how people are going to walk away. People walk away in the end because of these strongholds. Because when push comes to shove and it's time to stand up, people will back down in those areas that have strongholds in their lives. So last one, if you would. This is going to be kind of quick, this last piece, because I'm not going to get into a lot of in-depth with it, because you could probably do three months just on this last piece. We may get to that as we go through the series of stepping up our game. But the last one is the manifestation of Satan. His mission is to accuse you before the Lord in the court of heaven in order to destroy your destiny and steal your harvest and your blessing. His ultimate goal is to make you part of his harvest. See, again, in Luke twenty-two thirty-two, 32, in the voice translation, it's put this way. Simon, Simon, how Satan has pursued you that he might make you part of his harvest. You know how he makes you part of his harvest. He gets you to speak his words. He gets you to sow his seeds into your life. He gets, because there's strongholds in your life and you actually only see that as being part of your life, you sow those things into your life. And over time, he's able to go before the Lord and said, I want that. That's mine. Now how we know? Well, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. John 10.10 10 in the Passion says this, a thief has only one thing in mind. Please understand that. The devil only has one thing in mind. Satan himself has one thing in mind. Two, steal, slaughter, and destroy. Nothing else. He's unashamed about it, brash and bold about it. Yep, let's set up satanic clubs in the schools. Yep, let's cause all this havoc. Yep, let's do all this stuff and say we never do it. Yep. You've got to get this mindset. The children of the devil, there's two sets of kids in this world. That's it. Children of God and children of the devil. Those that know God, those who don't. That's it. I really like it because God made it really simple. That anybody can understand. It's not hard. There's only two types of kids. God's kids are the devil's kids. And the devil's kids, like we read in John 8, 44, I believe, they're just like their father. It says, who was a murderer from the beginning. There are people out there that have no qualms about killing you. They don't. They will not lose an ounce of sleep if you die. See, and that horrifies many of us because we're not like that. We don't understand how other people could be like that. That they value money more than you. That they see you as a money maker for them. We're horrified at that. That's why so many of us want to dismiss it. That's why we have strongholds in our lives and say, that's impossible. Even when the evidence can get presented right in front of you. Just like uh, over this whole two-year event, a lot of all this information that I was saying two years ago and others is coming out now, and people will look at it and say, no, no, that ain't right. Oh, no, no, that didn't happen. Oh, yeah, that special day in January last week, that was, you know, all about this. Oh, no, all this other information is coming out. Oh, no, no, that ain't right. 
had a discussion on Facebook about that yesterday. Put something up, and somebody says, oh, no, no, that ain't right. This is what happened. I said, did you even read the article I put up? The person said, no. Then I'm like, what the heck are you commenting about? You didn't read the article, and then you said, the people that publish the article aren't a valid source. See, that's what I mean. I, I'm not picking on that person. What I'm saying is, this is the state of the people that we are dealing with now. Even when you present the evidence before them, even when the people told you to put this thing on, it was okay. First they said, don't put it on. Then they said, do put it on. Now they're even saying, it doesn't do anything now. You see more people wearing them. Why? The damage has been done. They've been programmed to think that, and now they're at this stage of it because all those seeds were sown for two years. Now you can present the evidence. And they'll say, oh, no, no, that's a lie. Because all the seeds that were sown for the two years is now their perspective because their perspective is their reality. Truth no longer matters. The same people who told you, don't put it on, then put it on, doesn't work anymore except this certain kind now. Oh no, you still see people doing the same old stuff. Why? Protects me and protects you. No, 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 the same place that says it doesn't anymore. Oh no, no, that can't be right. People can't even see the truth anymore in front of them. Because they don't understand what I just said. Satan is out to pursue you and make you part of his harvest, and all he can do is lie. The enforcers are spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. So remember, four manifestations were on number four, four type of demonic enforcers, spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Their mission is to consistently attack your mind with accusations of past sins, sinful behavior and failures, along with inflicting your heart with feelings of guilt, shame, and unworthiness. Again, remember the four wants to root and ground you in this natural physical realm. It wants to attack you as a created being of this fleshly realm. So it's going to attack your mind. It's going to attack your emotions. It's going to attack your will. It's going to attack your soul, man. They also are the cheering section for Satan as he accuses you in the courts of heaven. Job chapter 1, 6 through 7. New Living Translation says this, One day the members of the heavenly court came to present themselves before the Lord, and the accuser Satan came with them. Verse 7, Where have you come from, the Lord asked Satan. Satan answered the Lord, I have been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. I'm patrolling it, watching everything's going on. I'm sending out my boys, and I'm sending out those lion spirits, and I'm doing all that stuff, but I'm watching everything that goes on. And then if you're ready, he says, hey, what about my servant Job? You know, he's an upright man. Yeah, only because you've got a hedge of protection around him. The story goes on. Then it goes into verse... Chapter 2, he says, okay, go and take everything he's got. There's a reason why. Job sowed for that, unfortunately, out of fear. Every one of his sacrifices he made before the Lord was done in fear. It wasn't done in faith. Because he said, in case my kids have done this, I'm going to do these sacrifices. I fear my kids have gone against the Lord. Job 2, 1 and 2. Chapter 2, verse 1 and 2 says, One day the members of the heavenly court came to present themselves before the Lord, and the accuser Satan came with them. Where have you come from, the Lord asked Satan. Satan answered the Lord, I have been patrolling the earth, watching everything going on. And what's interesting, the King James Version puts verse 2 this way. It said, The Lord said unto Satan, Whence hath comest thou? I'm going to switch gears into my old English. From whence cometh thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth, to and fro, back and forth. And then he says, from walking up and down, up and down in it. Reminds us of what? Jacob, when he wrestled with the angel, remember he saw 
the ladder come down, a portal from heaven opened, and the angels were going up and down. That's what Satan said. I've been going to and fro, and I've been going up and down. That's why he was in the court. Court of heaven. Going up and down, to and fro. He says, hey, see my servant Job? Looks like you took everything from him. Yeah, but skin for skin. He'll curse you. If you take his health. You got to understand, sickness and disease comes from him. Because then he afflicted him from the top of his head to the soles of his feet with boils. It was one smart thing Job did. Because he had such a spiritual wife, she was incredible. <laughs> I mean, an upstanding Christian woman she was. Looked right at her suffering husband and said, why don't you just curse God and die? Talk about a punch. Talk about a distraction. Remember I told you they're going to come from those closest to you and you love the most. That's who the enemy is going to use in your life. Those that are closest to you and you love the most. Why don't you just curse God and die? He said, God gave and God taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He never cursed God. That's the only reason why God said to Satan, yeah, you can afflict them, but you can't take his life. He didn't sow things to kill him. Because then in chapter 3, you start reading, he cursed the day he was born and all this stuff. He never spoke words of death over himself. That ought to be a lesson for all of us. Don't ever speak words of death over yourself. No matter how bad it gets. Don't ever sow seed to that place because it can be reaped. Zechariah 3, verse 1, in the voice translation says this, Then a heavenly messenger showed me a fourth vision. Joshua, the high priest, standing in front of the eternal special messenger who was presiding over the heavenly council meeting. Standing to Joshua's right was one of... One called the accuser, Satan. He was ready to argue that Joshua was unworthy to serve as high priest. And then the voice, as a little notation that I want to read to you, in his vision, Zechariah sees a heavenly court. Joshua, the high priest, is on trial, charged with impurity and accused of being unfit to serve as high priest. The accuser appears in the role of a prosecuting attorney, bringing charges and attempting to undermine the credibility of the one person God wants to lead his people. But the judge would have none of it as you continue to read the story. Now, like I said, I'm not going to get into real depth and stuff about the courts of heaven yet and all that. Other than to say this, if you're really having an issue trying to break through something, you need to bring it to the courtroom just like that. Because just in the natural, if there's a court hearing set against you and you don't show up, what happens? You lose by default. You never showed up. And then you go to war for your rest and it goes away until it gets taken care of. Bingo. Which basically says, you're now mine. This is going on all the time because we're so ignorant of this piece. The enemy is accusing us before the Lord. See, another understanding we have to get just as the enemy manifests in four ways, God has many facets. We tend to think God is one. God is three in one, but there's many facets of God. Jehovah Jireh, Sid Canoe. He's got many names because he has many functions and facets. Adonai, Yeshua, Jehovah. Many different functions. That's why he's called also the Lord of Harvest. And we'll probably get into this maybe next week. We'll start back at Genesis and kind of work our way through with a few things. Hopefully you'll understand better who we are, what we are, what does it really mean when we're made in the image of God, how that all originally happened, how this uh, thing of God's government got instilled into the earth way back in Genesis chapter 2. 
Satan's a legalist. He knows how to play the legal system. He knows this is a thing that can happen. That's why he had Joshua the high priest in the court of heaven. He ain't worthy. How many times do you think he's been up there against us saying, he ain't worthy? He ain't worthy to be that preacher there. What, what do you mean he's there, whatever? He don't have that kind of calling on his life. He ain't worthy. Say the same thing to you. Look at all that stuff they did in the past. They ain't worthy. And know what you simply do? Say, yes, Satan, you're right. I agree with you. I did that thing. But you know what? I stand here under the blood of Jesus. Because guess who your attorney is? The one with nail-pierced hands. Hole in his side. Who shed his blood on your behalf and paid that debt for you. So that as the accuser happens, just like in Zechariah chapter 3, he says, case dismissed. And we walk out. Not prideful and all arrogant, but understanding that our Lord paid for everything because it is finished. The fight isn't finished. Your redemption, the price that was paid for your redemption is now we walk out our own salvation with fear and trembling. So now it's these four and the angelic fours try to ground us to the earthly realm. We say, no, I am not an earthly being. I am not a human being. I am a spirit being living out a temporary human existence in this physical body on this earth at this present time. That's who I am. And I'm going to function like Jesus did who was a spirit being who temporarily walked out on this earth for those 33 and a half years who said, I can do the same things he did. So when I come up on those that need healing, I can lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Or I will just speak the word and they'll be healed without even going there. And I can cast out demons. And I can walk through people and walls like he did. And see, that one really got some of you. Because again, we have hindrances that are keeping us from believing that. What's the difference between laying hands on the sick and seeing him recover, or when they wanted to throw Jesus over the cliff and kill him, he just passed right through him, it said. How do you think that happened? They just got out of the way? This is an angry group of people who want to kill him. They didn't just all of a sudden decide and get a change of heart and part the ways so he could pass through. He walked through them. Why? He got in his spirit and he probably literally disappeared and they couldn't see him. Just like in the temple, they couldn't find him. When he did it twice, actually. To him hearing, yeah, but that was Jesus. No, yeah, but that was a human being filled with the Spirit of God who was birthed of a virgin. The only difference was he didn't have the sin nature that we had. He still came into this world the same way we all did. The only difference was we had a seed from a human. He had the seed from the Father, which made him sinless. So he could be the sinless lamb to pay for our sins on the cross. And when he rose from the dead, he took death, hell, and the grave and the keys with him and destroyed all that. So we could walk in utter victory every moment of every day. And I'm saying all that is because this is the thing that has to change. Honestly, again, this is not the biggest problem. It's this thing that's the problem. Because as soon as you say that, the devil is going to accuse you of your past. Yeah, but you screwed up there. I'm not there. Past is gone. Jesus, you handled the past. I got this now, which has already gone into the past, and this now has already gone into the past. Really, all I got is the future, and that's what I need to be walking towards and walking in. Do you understand? Every time we prophesy, we're speaking into the future and bringing back what we want to see in the future into the present now. 
And it doesn't happen, are we, immediately. I don't think people understand what prophetic voices actually do. They see something out there, they speak what they're seeing, and eventually that has to come to pass into here. And we call everybody false prophets. Well, they said this, and they said that, and they said there'd be two terms for this guy, and this and that. No, they saw it. It hasn't manifested yet. And all people are doing is destroying the seeds that were planted. We do that in our own life. No, I know what God told me. Told you, when I ran for the selectmen, I saw me getting it. He already put that in my heart. Told you, I would have been shocked if I lost. I really would have. Because I knew I won. Because I know he told me to do it. Then I needed some earthly wisdom from the woman back there. That's what I mean. We, we, we got to stop disconnecting how things work in the physical along with the spiritual. God's going to tell you to do something, and now you need to function it out properly in the natural. Like we said, we can lay hands on the sick and see him recover, but if you cause the sickness because you've been cooperating with the devil and doing bad things in your life, it, it's not going to work. Both the physical and the spiritual need to gel together. That's what Jesus did. Jesus did everything perfectly. So as he declared it, he walked it out sinlessly and it manifested. We need to do the same. So as we speak the word, we walk out the word, we're obedient to the word, we continue to confess the word and we'll reap the harvest of the word. We got to stop putting our time limit on it. Because we don't know the time. No man knows the day or the hour. Do you know Jesus is coming back? Yeah. Believe it? Yeah. And when he comes back, he ain't coming as no little baby. This world better watch out. He's coming with a sword in his mouth. You know, I got a picture of that. Finally, I went on a Google search looking for that. Well, duck, duck, go. The heck with Google. Search to find. You know how hard that was to find? Because I want that image. Do you know why? We have the same thing when we speak a sword comes out our mouth. The word of God comes out our mouth, which is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing and dividing asunder. Then it gives a little better image than death and life's in the power of the tongue. No, no, no. It's quick and sharper than a two-edged sword. You speak to a situation, it can become destroyed. All right, he's saying that's it. Lord, help us to get it. I know we're all going to get it in different ways. I get that. But Lord, help us to understand, if anything, the urgency of the hour. There's no more plan. No more plan. And unfortunately, is what he's saying. For, unfortunately for some of you, you're in the fourth quarter and the score is 47 2.10 and you gave up. Game ain't over. Fat lady didn't sing yet. Game ain't over. It ain't over till he says it's over. And you know what? When Joshua was battling, he needed a little bit more time. What happened? God stopped the sun. Gave him a little more time. Hey, you need a little more time? He'll give you a little more time. It ain't over. We're in the fourth quarter, and it's looking ugly. But you know what? We win. Doesn't matter what the score looks like. Doesn't matter what everything else is looking around us looks like. We win. And we need to walk that way and have our head high and talk that way and act that way when everyone else is making fun of you saying, you've lost your mind. Well, that's good. I don't want to live in my mind. I want to live in his mind. I want his mind. His faith, His everything, that I can be like Him. Not for me, but for you all, because you don't need Jim. You guys need Jesus. You need the Jesus in me. So, Father, thank you for this time we've had. Lord, for Friday night, as we worshiped you in spirit and truth, and, and today, Lord, just a great time to assemble with, with the family, Lord. Because that's what you created, a family. 
Help us to get that revelation too, Lord. You didn't create us to be individuals. You created man because you wanted a family. And we're family. All those that know Jesus as Lord are family. So Father, on behalf of this family, I thank you and praise you and honor you. That you're faithful. You're always good. You're never late. You never leave us nor forsake us. That we can do all things. That nothing is impossible to those that believe. So Father, this morning I pray some of those things have been torn down and broken that have hindered us from walking in a new level of faith, new level Christianity. I don't care what we call it, but Lord, we need to up our game, step up to the next level because it's devastating and it's embarrassing when you don't. And Lord, we're not here to embarrass you. We're here to display you and demonstrate who you are because you've given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So, Lord, we thank you, honor, and praise you now. And as we leave this place, we are encouraged, built up, challenged, but most of all, changed because we've submitted to what your Spirit wants to do in each one of our hearts. And we thank you now in the name of Yeshua. Amen and amen. Be blessed.